What's up everybody, welcome back once again to Axel's Analysis. As always, I'm the host of Man Too Cheap to Make Up His Own Name, so that's still an Axel Mulligan. Doing another Sunday show this week, basically. We had the first Sunday segue meetup yesterday, for those of you who listen to the show. Um, always a great podcast, my personal favourite one to listen to. Uh, there was myself, uh, met up yesterday with uh, Kinney, the host. Vicky Earls and Steve Dawson. We all had a great afternoon night. Uh, Vicky and Steve came down to Bristol. Um, and that was just really good afternoon night. So thanks to those guys for sort of making the day what it was, really. Um, and I was, anybody who's not listened to, anybody who does listen to the Sunday Segway podcast, rather, I was on the show this morning recording. So make sure you listen to it. Unfortunately, though, Kenny wasn't on. It's quite ironic, really, because he's been trying to get me on for a little while now. The one week that I am on, he can't make it. He's had to do a, a boot sale. So, you know, hopefully next time when I'm on, Kenny will be around as well. So, that was it was all good fun. And uh, Mr. Cook, Mr. Michael Cook, will be wearing a John Cena shirt for a week. 7-3, I beat him in the Beat the Clock Challenge this morning. And I'll keep... I'll keep quiet about it now because I don't like to rub it in people's faces. Uh, NXT this week was uh, it's the most disappointing show that they've had really since they've had it as the, um, the developmental territory in the WWE. You know, it's just normally when I write my notes, I've got like three pages filled up with notes. I've filled up an A4 page on both sides. And one of those sides is for the show. The other side is for the news, the birthdays, and so on and so forth. That kind of tells you what kind of show it was because it was it was lackluster. It really was in comparison to how they normally, how NXT normally is. This week wasn't just no, it didn't do it for me. It was it it was crap, was, for lack of a better word. It was crap. Uh, commentary team was Rich Brett and Renee Young and Alex Riley. They didn't do too bad this week. Even Renee Young, give her credit where it's due, she did all right this week. But they just didn't have much to work with because the stuff in the ring was shit, basically. Um, first match was the Ascension versus two jobbers. I didn't even hear any names mentioned for the team. Um, so whoever they were, basically they got their ass kicked in about three minutes. Um just another execution, as I say, really. Um, same old boring shit. I'm just fed up of seeing it, you know. The commentators are always talking about how the Ascension are, like, they're unbeaten and they've, they've dominated the tag team division, but they face, off the top of my head, one proper team, a short lived team, and a one off team. The proper team being Hunico and Camacho. The short lived team, Elo Cal and Callista. And the other team being uh, Sami Zayn and Tyson Kidd. Oh, and they did face um, Neville and Graves as well, just after they won the titles from them. You know, that's four teams. They've, they've had the titles for like 300 days or something like that. And they faced four tag teams with any sort of credibility, or wrestlers with any sort of credibility, not necessarily the tag teams, because as I said, uh, Tyson Kidd and Sami Zayn was just like a one-off. And uh, Elo Cow and Callisto was just a, like lasted for about two months that team. But now it's just they need some like the kickstart the division really because it's just not it's not what it should be and it's not what it could be. You know, I remember when they first started off the NXT tag team division, it was actually quite interesting. You know, you had uh, the British Ambition, you had it was Oliver Gray and Adrian Neville. Obviously, up until Neville got injured, you know, you had the Wyatt family, you had. I think the original Ascension were around then. You know, you had teams like that. And, you know, as much as they got teams there now, I just don't understand why they're not using them in the division. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, why aren't, like, uh, I don't know, Enzo and Cass going up against the Ascension? Or uh, Ty Villager and Jason Jordan? Or the board villains? Or just, just something, just a real tag team who we see week in, week out on the show. Why aren't they facing the tag team champions? It's just... It's frustrating to watch because I'm a big fan of tag team wrestling and it's it's the division's just dead. It has been for quite a long time now. Just they just need something to kick it out of the backside, really. 
Straight into the next match, another pointless part of the show. Mojo fucking Rawley versus Tyler Breeze. And this was over in about 40 seconds. And 35 seconds of that was Tyler Breeze running away from Mojo because he had his broken finger. Uh, Breeze hit the beauty shot. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a match between Bailey and Summer Rae where the referee kept refusing to count because Bailey's shoulders weren't on the mat. When Mojo lost this match, his left shoulder was up. You know, it's just a, it's a double standard, you know. You've got, you need some consistency. If the consistency's not there, you just, because I remember these kinds of things, and the consistency's not there, you just think, mm, what's, what's the point? Do you know what, what's the point? You know, just get proper referees down there, get Mike Kyoto down there, get Charles Robertson down there, Chad Patton. I know obviously you've got to build up these newer referees and everything, but. They're not doing their jobs right, are they? Let's be honest. I mean, to be fair to the referee, I don't know who it was in this match. He was on the blind side of Mojo, but Mojo's got to learn to put his shoulders down on the mat. This is one reason why I don't like Mojo Ball. He's just so full of amateur shit. And I don't mean amateur wrestling. I mean, he's just, he's just amateur. He's just, no. I think a lot of people can see why I don't like Mojo fucking Rawley. Uh, this is just, that's, that's just sloppy. It's sloppy and it's lazy. Get your shoulder bag, take the fall, and move on to the next week. Just I feel like I'm banging my head against the brick wall with so many things with the WWE right now, not just NXT. The main roster, just so a lot of it's really good. And a lot of it, as I said, I'm just banging my head against the brick wall because it's less painful than watching some of this shit, you know? How difficult is it to get your shoulders on the mat this week? We had it with Bailey two, three weeks ago. We got with Mojo fucking Rawley this week. It's, it's simple fundamentals of wrestling. You're supposed to lose the match. You put your shoulders down on the mat. I, I can't see the difficulty in it. I've never wrestled, but I can't see the difficulty in it. Charlotte versus Summer Rae was up next for the NXT Women's Championship. And it went on far too long. I really struggled to get into it. And the crowd did as well. They were doing Mexican waves. You know, it's just... There was nothing that stood out in the match that made you sort of, like, get onto the edge of your seat and then think, oh... There was there was nothing like that at all. It was just... It was all on the ground. It was all map-based. And the ending just came out of nowhere. Sometimes I like finishes like that, but that's when there's been an exciting build-up to the finish. Like the succession of um, like moves, but this this was all just based on the mat. And I, I do like mat wrestling, but if you if I'm watching mat wrestling, I mean like one of the, like the first ever match I saw was Daniel Bryan versus William Regal, two brilliant mat wrestlers. But they'll mix it up in other areas of the game where like Bryan will fly or Regal will use suplexes and things like that. Whereas all of this was just on the ground the whole time and it just oh, it just bored me. And then just out of nowhere, Charlotte hit the bow down to the Queen, one, two, three, and she retained. And the disappointing f- point about the whole thing was that Sasha Banks didn't come out to intervene at all, which would have been a smart move because then for the next show, the next live show, you set up Sasha Banks versus Summer Rae versus Charlotte for the NXT Women's Championship and bam. Because Sasha would make that match a hell of a lot better than what this was. In fact, I'm quite disappointed now. Like I, I like Summer as a wrestler, and Charlotte's won me over in recent months. I'm disappointed in the two of them, I, like for this match. And I just think Sasha Banks would have just added a completely different dimension to that entire, the entire match. Really, there was just the chemistry wasn't there. And so the crowd were doing Mexican waves, so you could tell that they could, didn't give a shit about it. But where this leaves the NXT Women's Championship, I don't know. They've had they've had tapings recently. I think this was the last show of the last set of tapings, so we've got three weeks coming up now, for fresh tapings, and just have to see where it goes from there. You know, I'd I'd like to see Sasha as the number one contender to Charlotte, because it was them two that broke it off for the BFFs and they've not had a one-on-one match, which I think they need it, really. Because otherwise, it's just like Swagger and Cesaro on the main roster, isn't it, you know? 
people have been teaming together for a little while and they're, uh, there's, there's no match to end the feud or set up, settle a feud or whatever, but no. Nah. Just, well, this entire show was booked completely poorly. One match that I did enjoy was the next one. It was the Vaud Villains versus Callisto and Hunakara. It was a fun little match, to be fair. The Vaud Villains always get the crowd going with their entrances. You know, it's good fun, like, because the crowd interact with it, like, clapping along with the music. Um, and everybody likes watching, like, Lucha, Lucha wrestlers, Luchadors, like, Hunakara is one of the best, like, hybrid type of wrestlers, I think, in the WWE because you go from one style to another, as I said before. As uh, Hunako, he's more of a grappler. As Sinkara, he's a high flyer. Kind of like Cody Rhodes, really, going from Cody Rhodes to Stardust. Two completely different styles, completely changed the moveset. And, you know, he can pull it off, to be fair to him. Callisto is an exciting guy as well, you know, he, he flies around the ring a lot. Hopefully, I'm hoping actually that this will be a new tag team, uh, Callisto and Hunakara, because they've got the same sort of background, you know, both mass wrestlers, both from Mexico. You know, they can work a decent match, they can fly around the ring, they can grapple a bit. And as I said, they're both just fun to watch. Um, this is Hunakara, like, as Sin Cara, not Mr. Cara, because that was just fucking Botchamania. That had a whole Botchamania show of its own. Um, I, I actually, I was quite impressed with the finish of it actually. Um, Callisto, he had, uh, Simon, uh, Simon Gotch locked in a stunner like position and he floated over the top of him and he hit a reverse bulldog, kind of like a zigzag in a way, I suppose, but without sort of like landing on his back. And it was, it was really well done. Uh, they picked up the win with that. I was, I'm just hoping that this is going to be a new part of the tag team division. Callisto and uh, Hunakara, but we'll see where they go with it. You know, as I said just now with the with the Ascension, the tag team division is just dead in NXT, and something like this could liven it up a bit. But where, whether they go with it or not is another matter. Obviously, as I said before, they're on about putting Callisto up into the main roster sooner rather than later. Obviously, you don't want to bring him up too soon, but you don't want to leave it too late. But then he's 27. I just sort of looking at all the pros and cons of it. He's 27. He's got plenty of time. Hunakara's worked up on the main roster he's worked in NXT very talented guys both of them so you know we'll see where they go with it uh, the main event Adrian Neville versus Rusev before the match we got usual crap from Rusev and Lana uh, but it's another one I just struggled to get into I don't know why I just think the chemistry wasn't there between the two we've had a lot of that just on the whole in the WWE recently, like Paige and AJ at Battleground, I struggled to get into that because the chemistry just wasn't there. And, you know, that's that's the feud that should be like the lead interest Stratus of today. Uh, but Neville and Rusev, it, the match in itself didn't make sense. I mean, like, if, if you're the NXT champion or whether you're the NXT champion, WWE champion or whatever, if somebody's sort of come down to face you there's got to be a reason behind it you can't just sort of throw like you wouldn't you wouldn't just throw John Cena against Damien Sandow now with the gimmick that Sandow's got it's just it's pointless and having Rusev just randomly facing Adrian Neville's kind of pointless as well um it, the end of the match came about when Lana she had the referee distracted um Avoid the referee never throws Lana out from ringside or any manager at the moment when they're distracting the competitors. I, I don't know. It's just, again, it's a, like a double standard, really. And, uh, like Harper and Rowan got thrown out from ringside during the battleground match between Jericho and Bray Wyatt. Lana's trying to get involved here. Why isn't she being thrown out? Anyway, she had the referee distracted. Tyler Breeze came down trying to distract Adrian Neville, but he sort of managed to knock him off the apron. Neville ended up getting the upper hand, and he had Rusev down. He, uh, he super kicked him in the face, and he sort of fell onto his back. Neville went up top to hit the red arrow, but as he was about to hit it, or as he was about to go off the rope, rather, Breeze knocked his leg off, causing a disqualification finish. 
Rusev does the accolade, and uh, Lana eventually tells him to stop. And another thing with the accolade is after the matches, I don't know if anybody else has ever thought about this or mentioned it on their shows before. Generally, after a match, if you lock in a submission, I'm not necessarily talking about this match because it ended in disqualification. After a match, if if the match ends in submission, like Rusev obviously wins all his matches with the accolade, and you don't let go of the submission afterwards, the referee should count to five, and if he gets to a five count, you're disqualified. I don't understand why that doesn't happen with Rusev, you know. Um, I know obviously they're trying to build him up as this big monster who's going to kick the shit out of everybody and nobody's going to be able to stop him and so on and so forth. But why isn't the referee count to five and then Lana at four and a half just sort of, you know, waving her hand out as she does to say, stop, you know, that's enough. I think that would just add a little bit of extra dimension to Rusev's character, really, that, you know, he's going to do what he wants until, well, he's doing what he wants anyway until Lana tells him to stop. But on the same side as well, you've got to look at it in the fact of the, the you know, inverted commas, the rules of wrestling. If you don't release a submission hold by a five count after the bell has signed it, you're disqualified. What I just don't understand why they're not using it for Rusev. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, worst NXT show since they've used it as a de- developmental territory for the WWE. I've given this a 4 out of 10, and that's me being generous, because this show was fucking shit. I hated it. It was a struggle to watch it. It really was. It became a chore. It was fucking awful. There's, there's like no progression to what we're going to see next week. There's, there was like no main event match announced for next week. It just... It's, it's gone down over the last two weeks, and I don't like it because it's generally my favourite show to watch on the whole. You know, obviously, like, Raw has its, its big moments. SmackDown has its moments. I don't really watch main event or superstars, so I can't really comment there. But the last two weeks have been fucking dreadful for NXT. And I hope it's not going to go down the route where, with Raw, you get, like, one good show a month and then three ones that nobody likes. I just... I hope it's not going down that route, but I... I for whatever reason, I can see it happening because I used to like watching NXT every week. But I just hope it's not going to go down the same route as Raw and SmackDown. Anyway, on to the news for this week. WWE have hired a new, in inverted commas or quote marks, a top acting coach, uh, basically to help the NXT guys with their promos and their delivery and everything, which is a good move. I mean, what I'd like to see is them allow guys from the main roster who still need to work on their mic skills. Guys like Roman Reigns, who definitely needs to touch up on his skills because Reigns is very monotonal. People are probably going to sit there and say that I am as well, which I, I probably am. I, I don't know and I don't care. I don't get paid to deliver promos. Roman Reigns does. He needs to get down to the performance center, whether he can work with his acting coach or whether he can just sit in the studio have somebody critique him, just work on his promos. Because, let's face it, his in-ring stuff isn't there yet either. So he's going to need something. It's like, I've always said The Rock wasn't a great wrestler, but he was inch perfect on promo. So if Roman Reigns can get down there, like Tyson Kidd still needs a little bit of work, like Justin Gabriel could do some work on his promos. People like that get down the performance center, Try and sort of knock on the door of this acting coach. Get some tips, get some advice, get him to listen to what you're delivering. Further than that, just fucking get Enzo Amore to listen to you, because that guy is the shit. He is fucking awesome. But I've run that into the ground over the last few weeks anyway, about my love for Enzo Amore. Uh, apparently as well, Prince Devitt signed, um, and it's going to be announced quite soon. One thing that worries me with Devitt, and actually features in the birthdays this week, is his age. He's 33 now. And how long of a WWE career is he going to have if he's going to spend, say, a year in NXT? It could be like Adam Rose, where Adam Rose is now on the main roster. He's 35 years old. Or right, Granted, Adam Rose spent six or seven years down at developmental. But where, where's Devitt going to go? When he gets to the main roster, what's he going to do? It's just... I don't see the point in hiring guys 
at that kind of age. Granted, if they got a lot in the tank still, fair enough, but once you get to 30, that's your breaking point for me. Like, Ty Denninger is 32, I think. You've got to cut those guys loose. You can't, for me, you can't hire guys older than 30. I mean, Kevin Steen's just turned 30. But I think he's probably got a bit more gas in the tank than like a Ty Dillinger. Um, but 33, it's only three years between Devin and Steen, but for me, this, it's a, it's a very wide gap. You know, Kevin Steen can have a 10 year career in the WWE. And you can make fulfillments out of that, whereas Devitt could have a six or seven year career and it's just like, well, what the fuck was the point in that, you know? Um, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong and I'll eat my words, but we'll see where they go with it. It's one of those things where I, I keep saying it, we'll see where they go with it. But it's a case of having to wait and see where they are going to go with a lot of things in the WWE because you, you look at the shows and some things don't make sense or you see something in the news and it doesn't make sense, but then you think, well, we'll see what happens with it. And sometimes it turns out good. And I'm hoping Devitt will turn out good. Uh, apparently, Rey Mysterio um, isn't cashing in his paychecks that he's been sent um, in the post by the WWE. And that's usually a move to say he's trying to get out of his contract. For what reason he's trying to get out of his contract, I don't know. Um, I think, like, obviously he's had a lot of injuries over the years and Maybe he just wants to sort of go back to Mexico and sort of not necessarily work their shows as a wrestler, but maybe sort of make appearances and I don't know, maybe get around the indie circuit a little bit. But it'd be a shame the day he does leave because I've said it before, Rey Mysterio, in my opinion, is a legend. Um, a lot of people give him a lot of shit, but I, I don't see how people can give Rey Mysterio shit. You know, he's He's always been a consistent performer. He's always put in 110%. He's worked through injuries, worked through a lot of injuries, some really bad ones. Um, he's, he's just had so much bad luck for the last five years, six years or whatever. Um, but it'd be a sad day when it does come to him leaving. You know, let's say he's had some incredible matches. But we'll see when the time comes where at least the, where, where the path goes for uh, Rey Mysterio. You know, I'd like to see him still be part of the WWE. I don't think they give him like a Legends contract because I don't think that they would be willing to pay him as much as a guy like Shawn Michaels or Ricky Steamboat, who's recently just taken on a Le- Legends contract, or Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan or whoever, Jimmy Hart. But um, no, I'd like to see him still involved in some way, shape or form. If it's not as a performer, maybe helping out guys like uh, Callisto and Hunakara down at the performance center as a, like a, like a lucha coach, maybe. I don't know. But again, it's like I said, well, it'll be unfortunate when he, uh, when he does go. Uh, this week's birthdays, um, got a few on there. July the 21st, you've got Sean Stasiak turned 44. Uh, July the 22nd, uh, Fandango 33. Shawn Michaels, 49. Uh, David Von Erich. I don't normally talk about guys who haven't worked for the WWE, but I'm a big fan of WCCW, and I'm a big, big fan of the Von Erich Freebirds feud. Uh, David Von Erich would have turned 56. He was the first wrestling brother to be part of the tragedy, the Von Erich family tragedy. Not many people know this, um, and anybody who's seen the WCCW DVD of the WWE put out a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a younger son, um, Jackie, I think his name was. He he died. Uh, he was the eldest son, but he died uh, from like a big electric shock as a child. So he was like the first part of the Von Erich family tragedy, and David was the second. Uh, he died in uh, Tokyo whilst doing a tour out there. Uh, but he would have been 56 on Tuesday, July the 22nd. And the Fabulous Moolah would have been 91. Uh, July the 25th, as I said, Prince Devitt, 33. July the 26th, Greg Garnier. Again, it's not somebody I like who worked for the WWE on screen. I think he had like a backstage role after his dad was inducted into the Hall of Fame, which must have been about 2005 or 2006, Vern Garnier. 
Uh, but Greg Gagne worked for the AWA for his dad. He was a good wrestler, but he was never what Vern was, which was unfortunate for him because Vern thought that Greg was the dog's bollocks, basically. Which, for anybody who doesn't know what that means, he thought he was fucking awesome. Greg, Greg was a good wrestler. I've seen a lot of his matches, but he wasn't on par with Vern. And he always had that stigma attached to it where the fa- the son's got to be as good as the father. But unfortunately for him, he never was. Uh, July the 27th, Matt Bourne, the former Don't Decline, uh, would have turned 57. Triple H uh, turn, turning 45. This is today, actually, sorry, July the 27th. Matt Bourne, 57. Triple H, 45. Shannon Moore, 35. And Dolph Ziggler, 34. This week in wrestling history, or this week in WWE history, because it's all WWE and I never really talk about any other companies. Uh, July the 21st, uh, The Rock defeated The Undertaker and Kurt Angle to become WWE champion. That was at Vengeance in 2002. Um, that was just after Brock Lesnar won King of the Ring and it set up Brock versus Rock for SummerSlam and then Rock fucked off for another six months. Didn't really care about that title win because it was just like it was. It was like the one that he had last year. Just I, I didn't give a fuck. I, I I just completely got off the rock the last few years because he's always talking about WWE being home. Well, when the hell do you ever see him at home? Do you know what I mean? Uh, the next one's actually from the following day, uh, July the twenty second. Rob Van Dam defeated Jeff Hardy to unify the Intercontinental and European titles. That was on Raw. 2002. That was actually quite a good match. It was a ladder match, if I remember rightly. And, uh, yeah. Rob Van Dam unified the IC and European titles. July the 24th. Um, this is from 2005 at the Great American Bash. Heidenreich and Animal defeated Eminem to become WWE Tag Team Champions. Um, I don't really remember the background of the story behind it because I wasn't really that interested in it at the time and I still don't really give a fuck now because Heidenreich was just shite. Um, but I remember Animal coming back and there was, Heidenreich was in some sort of feud with Eminem at the time and I think he was like trying to find a partner to beat them and Animal sort of steps up to the plate and, yeah, they, they called themselves like the Legion of Doom and it just didn't really work. It was just, you know, whatever. Heidenreich came out with the fucking Road Warriors face paint on that really just that was just like a, a kill. That just killed it. It's just nah. Bad enough when Dross was there. Road Warriors should always remain Paul Ellerin, uh Animal and uh Hall. Why Dross was there and why Heidenreich was there, I ain't got a fucking clue. July the 26th, Jeff Hardy defeated CM Punk to become the World Heavyweight Champion. That was at Night of Champions in 2009. That was just before Jeff left. He lost the title at SummerSlam, I think it was, and then he lost the rematch, uh, cage match on SmackDown that following week. I, I actually quite like that feud because that's really what put Punk on the map. And as much as Punk's never really been a, like the biggest Jeff Hardy advocate, he's, I don't think he's ever really sort of appreciated what Jeff did for him because Jeff was the most over guy in the company at the time, even more so than Cena. He was like selling Cena and merchandise, which is, you know, it's a big enough thing in itself. I don't think Punk really gave him like the gratitude and like the respect that he deserved for it. He just, they basically just didn't like one another, but they had some incredible matches. So this is weird to see that guys that don't get along actually have these really good matches. But that was a really good feud that was. Uh, July the 27th, uh, so 11 years ago today, Eddie Guerrero defeated Chris Benoit to win the reinstated United States Championship. That was at Vengeance in 2003. There was like an eight-man tournament. Um, so it was exclusive to SmackDown at the time. And Stephanie McMahon uh, needed something to trump rule where they had reinstated the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, it was like a month or two before. And... They had this eight-man tournament, really good tournament, and uh, Eddie and Chris Benoit got to the final. Really good match to open the show, which is usually the case with the WWE, to open up a pay-per-view. And uh, Eddie defeated Benoit. I think Rhino uh, speared Benoit. I can't remember if it was accidentally or on purpose, but I remember him spearing him, and Eddie sort of did the whole lie, cheating and stealing thing, and 
ended up taking the title home. Uh, that's the end of the show. As usual, just follow me on Twitter at Axel Mulligan. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Podomatic channel, the Mixcloud channel. Go back and listen to all the other episodes. I've not got them all on Mixcloud, but I've got them all so far on Podomatic and on YouTube. So go back and give all them a listen. Um, shout outs this week as usual. Uh, Tim Vicious, make sure you look out for Vicious Rants on YouTube. You can find him on Twitter at Tim Vicious and at Tim underscore Vicious. Sunday Segway Podcast. As I said, I was on there this morning with Shug's hosting it. It was really good fun. And uh, Mr. Cook, I look forward to seeing your pictures of you wearing John Cena t-shirts. Go for the lime green one. I think it'll bring out your eyes. Um, yeah, you can find them on Twitter, at Sunday Segway. Uh, you can listen to them on YouTube, Stitcher Radio, uh, iTunes. You know, uh, they've got the Sunday Segway app. If you listen to them on iTunes, make sure you give them a rating so they can get up the iTunes charts. Uh, at James Paris 33 uh, you can listen to James's Wrestling Ramble on Podomatic and Mixcloud and YouTube uh, James is like he, he, he was actually like the referee between mine and Michael's match this morning actually um, but some of those questions I, like, I, was, I was quite nervous about it because James normally does really hard questions and I was like I know the answer to all of these so thank you very much sir uh, at Pro Wrestling Smart or at PW Smart Talk, um, at Wrestling Rambles. Make sure you check out WrestlingRambles.com. Loads of really, really good blogs over there. Um, you know, I've written for them in the past. Um, just check them out. It's really good stuff over there. And at Tony underscore Walker. Make sure you check out Tony's podcast. At the Wrestling Matters Podcast. You can find the uh, Twitter page for the Wrestling Matters Podcast at WM Podcast. You can listen to that on YouTube, Stitcher Radio, iTunes. Make sure, again, if you listen to it on iTunes, you uh, give it a rating so it's totally can get out the charts. You've got Podomatic as well. So make sure you listen to all those guys' podcasts. It's all really good stuff. Uh, and that's the end of the show, guys. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll see you again next week.